I've boiled down everything I've learned in the last 35 years to have effective, positive communication in both your business and personal relationships. And I'm teaching it all to you today. So in this episode, this first one, uh, you'll learn the three reasons why you've tried communication tools in the past and why they haven't worked or, you know, haven't been effective in the long term. And then in the next episode, I'll teach you the five signs to look out for to know that you're not communicating. That happens. And then finally, I'll be devoting a third entire episode to my five-step process to effective communication in every relationship. Lots of surprises are coming. Uh, so stay tuned. So let's talk about there's really three reasons why you've tried communication tools in the past and they haven't worked. And again, these episodes are going to kind of build on each other. They stand alone, but you know, um, they're all sort of a cohesive piece. And I've said, you know, obviously there's everything I'm going to say in these next three episodes. I've said, you know, good portion of it in other places. I've just never brought it together in this way, kind of a comprehensive, clear guide to the whole thing. Uh, so here we go. And, and could you know, you've tried communication tools in the past. You maybe you've been to couples counseling or counseling, or you had attended workshops, you read books, you listened to the, this podcast or another one, you watched all the YouTube videos and to learn how to communicate more effectively in your personal life, your work life, wherever that was, you've tried the new tool, right? You, you learn it with, with vim and vigor. You bring all your energy to it. Maybe, and maybe even saw some positive changes, but you know, you soon, you kind of find yourself falling back into those old unwanted patterns. Well, okay. So there's three main reasons that I have found that when you've tried communication tools before and they haven't worked, these, the, this is it. And the good news is that once you understand these concepts, you'll be able to effectively use all the great tools I'm going to teach you later. <laughs> so, you, you know, you'll, you'll really be ready. And I want to really say, I've said really a lot. I apologize. I want to say clearly that I end up repeating the things I'm about to teach you to pretty much every single client I work with, whether that's, you know, coaching an executive to be more effective in leadership or someone who's trying to get their partner to understand them better. You've likely, again, heard me say some of these things before in various ways, but again, I'm bringing them all together. I want you to shut out all the doubt and the noise and come back to these like your mantra. That's what I want. So reason number one, it's failed before is because you don't realize your unconscious is ruling all your communication. It is. Your unconscious is ruling all of your communication, really. Well, almost all of it. So, and let me, I want to lay down a few definitions before I get too deep into all this. So, so when I speak of your conscious mind, when I say conscious, I'm talking about, you know, your thoughts, your feelings, your memories, uh, really what you're aware of in any given moment. Right now you're using your conscious mind to listen to me. I'm using my conscious mind as I speak to you. I'm thinking of things. I'm, you know, coming to stuff. So, and it's, but that's, it feels like your dominant brain, right? It feels like that's all you're doing is thinking from there, but it's not. Your conscious is actually driven by your unconscious or your subconscious brain. And again, let me get clear on some definitions because I do use these terms interchangeably a lot, unconscious and subconscious. And uh, I've heard people ask a lot of times, well, what's the difference? And the short answer is there isn't a difference. It's the same thing in the therapy world. If you're speaking, if you're speaking to anybody, you know, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a, any kind of kind of counselor, mental health worker type thing, we use the term unconscious, but if you're, you know, speaking to anybody on the street, uh, unconscious means someone's passed out, right? <laughs> we use the term mental health professionals as a noun. We, we use unconscious as a noun. You know, that guy is ruled by his unconscious. He doesn't understand why he's acting that way. While you might say, use it as an adjective, right? Uh, hey, that guy got knocked out and now he's unconscious. So I use the terms interchangeably. I don't want you to get worried if you hear me use one and then the other. I'm really talking about the same thing. Uh, 
So I just want to lay that out first because those questions have come in for, for, from you. And I want to make sure we're clear as I speak about uh, the, all that's happening. Okay. So, so back to our program. I get all excited, don't I? I just start gabbing and then I lose where I am. Okay. But I haven't, I'm here. So, okay. So if you've been following me for a while, if you have been here in the love that is our relationship, then you know, I read a lot. <laughs> I'm reading all the time. I'm constantly reading. And the one I say, one of the books I've come back to over and over is uh, by Timothy Wilson, an amazing uh, author researcher. Uh, he has a book called Strangers to Ourselves, Discovering the Adaptive Unconscious. I know that just sounds like I'm so smart that I read that, doesn't it? But I'm not, you could read it too. But for me, Timothy Wilson, if you're hearing me out there, Timothy, I love you so much. This guy is one of the unsung heroes when we talk about kind of our quest to learn about why we do what we do and how to control or change it. And he has another book, Redirect, that I love. Malcolm Gladwell talks about him. I mean, th this is the dude, okay? We should all be bowing down. Anyway, so one of the things that he, I've long used that Wilson wrote about in that book is the understanding that your conscious brain, which we've just described, processes information at a rate of 50 bits per second, while your subconscious or unconscious brain processes information at a rate of 11 million bits per second. And I am going to out myself right now because it's my dream that Timothy might listen to me one day. <laughs> I'm going to be completely transparent. Okay. He actually says in his book that it's 40 bits, not 50. And I have to tell you, so I read the book years ago and somehow I had misremembered the, I had said 50 instead of 40 as I was talking. And so I've been saying 50, not 40 for a really long time now. I mean, 10 years, I don't know, a really long time. And I reread his book, I don't know, during the pandemic or during the, when everybody was on lockdown, I had reread the book. I hadn't read it in a long time. And much to my chagrin, I saw that it said 40 and I thought, ah, crap, but I'm going to stick to 50. How do you like that? I'm just sticking with it. I just want you to know the truth. And I don't think it makes that big a difference when I say 50 bits versus 40 bits. And we're talking about 11 million. So, you know, I think we're okay. But I did want to, you know, out myself and there you go. All right. So, so again, so if my conscious brain is processing information at a rate of 50 bits per second, and my subconscious is processing at a rate of 11 million bits per second, this means that whoever you're speaking to doesn't hear what you say, they hear what you mean. I say this a lot. You can say all the right things, but if your unconscious believes something else, that's what the other person is listening to. So, and you know, because you've been chatting with someone at work and they were saying all the right things and you thought this person is so full of crap. You know, you've had this experience. <laughs> uh, you know, you've had that hunch that something's going on with your partner and you, you know, you even though they're acting like everything's fine. And then you find out later you were right. So these are the times that you're picking up on those 11 million bits versus the 50. You're hearing what someone else's subconscious is putting out versus what maybe they're saying. Maybe they're saying, hey, everything's fine, but you can kind of feel that there's something else. So the problem, is, I think people forget, this works the other way. This, this is true the other way also. When you're trying to communicate with someone else and they then pick up on what your subconscious mind is communicating as opposed to what you're actually saying. So this is one of the main reasons, really, I mean this, that there's so many miscommunications. Uh, there's so much distrust. You know you distrust. If someone's saying something, but you feel something else, you don't trust them. And that's what happens with you. And when trust breaks down, communication is broken down. So this is, again, why you can feel like you're just going crazy. You're hearing one thing, but you really feel another and you're just going nuts. So maybe you've been working on a particular relationship in your life. If you're listening to this, you probably have. Maybe you're having trouble with your partner or your kid or your coworker, whatever. And you, you, know, you read a book, you go to counseling, you're, you, you're trying out that new communication tool or strategy with your partner or your mom or your sibling, whoever. And consciously you're thinking, yeah, this is really going to help. But subconsciously there's doubt, maybe some resentment. And so I'm going to give you a few examples. You know, your subconscious dialogue 
maybe go something like this with your partner. Uh, oh, we've had these problems for a really long time. It's going to take forever to make changes. And I, I just don't know if I have it in me. I'm exhausted. So even though you're sort of trying the tool, that's what your partner's picking up on. Maybe with a work colleague, you're having an issue with a, somebody at work and you're thinking oh, nothing ever, nothing is ever going to change because they refuse to do anything differently or even see that they're part of the problem. Or you're speaking to your dad, but thinking again inside, oh, I've asked him so many times to stop being critical and he just, and he gets better for a little while, but then he ends up just doing it again. You know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Nothing ever works. People don't change. By the way, that's not true. People do change. That's my job. Uh, <laughs> you change. Come on. Others can too. You know, but again, even sometimes you think it consciously, uh, you do think it consciously, but most of it is, is unconscious. Most of it is happening behind the scenes. Because you, again, you might notice it sometimes, but you're not all the time. I'm telling you, you're not, and you're not noticing how deep it goes. Uh, so, and it affects, it's absolutely affecting your communication. So, but you know, you, you forge ahead, <laughs> you've learned this new tip and, you know, but you're trying it out with your partner, your coworker, whoever, and, but unbeknownst to you, the other person is picking up on your doubt, your resentment, your anxiety, that helpless feeling, the hopeless feeling. And it makes them not want to change because it feels the same. It feels kind of fake what you're doing. Because it, again, it's not aligning. It's not matching up. And they pick up, other people pick up on that incongruity, just again, like you do when someone's doing it to you. So they are thinking probably again, subconsciously, probably not even aware they're thinking it. They're thinking something like, well, well, sure. You know, she's acting nice now. Let's see how long this is going to last. That kind of thing. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to wait it out. And so then they don't change, even though you're using your fabulous new tool. And when you don't see the changes you want, you know, even though you're doing all this work, you think, see, nothing works. And you revert to the same old patterns, which leave the other person thinking that they were right not to waste time trying to do anything differently. <sighs> I know it's exhausting, right? I'm going to teach you how to fix all this, but I'm just saying this is a problem. Reason number two that those communication, communication tools have kind of failed in the past or haven't worked long-term is that your brain is keeping you stuck. And I'm going to talk about two parts to this. So, and you're on, I get it. You're unconscious and conscious are part of your brain too, but you know, I have to come up with cute subtitles. So there you go. So if you have left... If you try to communicate with someone and you have left the conversation feeling misunderstood or not heard, think about it over time. If you keep, if that keeps happening, you're going to start developing feelings. Uh, you're going to start feeling frustrated. You're going to start developing resentments, sadness, anxiety, again, that hopeless helplessness, all that. And when that happens, you know, as you're focusing on this, you spend a lot of time focusing on the other person and what's wrong with them what they're not doing or what they're doing too much of. And when you start thinking like this you and feeling like this, you start to see negative, of course, everywhere. And you just, what you're doing is you prove yourself right. And there's two main reasons you do this. One is your confirmation bias and the other is your reticular activating system. So I want to talk about your confirmation bias first. Now, your brain, your brain's amazing. Your brain works as fast as a computer that can process one trillion bits of information a second, a trillion bits of information a second. That's how fast your brain works. You have about a hundred billion neurons in your brain. And each of those connects to about 10,000 other neurons. So things are happening faster than you can imagine. And you might have even heard before that you only use 10% of your brain. That's actually not true. You actually use the majority of your brain power all day long, but about 95% of it is that subconscious that is going on subconsciously. So that's why you think that. And I, I think of your subconscious mind uh, like an overbearing but loving Jewish mother. And I can say that because I am one. Uh, it, you know, it takes your subconscious mind takes care of your physical self, 
and your mental self. Isn't that nice? Just like your, your Jewish mommy likes to do. So it takes care of your physical self through something called your homeostatic impulse. And this is all the stuff that's controlled by your autonomic nervous system. Like, you know, your breathing, your respiration, your body temperature, your heartbeat, all that good stuff. And uh, <laughs> this is, <laughs> I always joke that because, you know, Jewish mothers, we are consumed when our kids are little with like poop and things like that and sleep. And all that. So now I know why. Anyway, uh, and like a good Jewish mother, again, your subconscious is also regulating your mental self. You've got a ton of information coming in every second. So your subconscious, get this, it's, it's constantly filtering out what's important and what's not. It does this by bringing and listen closely. Here we go. I'm going to I'm all on my desk. Listen closely. It does this by bringing your attention to anything that's repeated. And, and repeated thoughts are also known as beliefs. Beliefs are just something you think all the time. So in the end, your brain only shows you things that confirm what it already believes. Some, and we psychologists call this confirmation bias. And so it basically means that your subconscious will search for and favor information that supports something you already believe, and it'll ignore information that doesn't support what you already believe. Uh-huh. So, so think, so repetition ends up being your best friend and your enemy, you know, the repetition of thoughts. The more you notice and feel something, the more priority your brain gives it. So, and this works against you, of course, with things like any repeated fears you have, any anger, resentments, all that good stuff. Those repeated negative unwanted thoughts create repeated negative unwanted feelings, which are then ingrained in your subconscious. Yeah. So when you allow your brain to think over and over that something isn't going to work or, you know, your boss is a jerk and that's all you're going to think and see, it's all you're going to think and see, that's it. So, and this is why, by the way, it's so hard to incorporate new communication tools among other things in your life. Okay. So for example, one of my favorite tools is to set intention before a conversation. I'll be going over that later, but not in this episode, but the next, uh, one of the next ones. So when you first start to set intention with your partner every day, your brain doesn't think it's very important because it's not, hasn't been repeated much and it doesn't assign much energy to it. So that's why you'll forget to do it. I meet with couples all the time. They're like, oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, it used to work and I forgot. So this is why. So, but over time, if you repeat something over and over, your brain assigns more and more importance to it. It says, oh, that's something we're repeating. That's something we have to pay attention to. I'm going to favor it. So initially, again, it's hard to remember to do something, but if you stick to it, you'll remember more easily until it's automatic. And before you know it, you've really got true behavior change resulting in more effective communication. So uh, that's that first part. And the other part is the RAS, the reticular activating system, which I've talked about a ton. I don't care if you're sick of it, you gotta hear it. Uh, you know, again, your RAS, uh, for short, it's a, it's a network of neurons located in the brainstem. And it's really where most of your senses come through. I think the only sense that doesn't come through there is your sense of smell. And it's a filter between your conscious and your subconscious brain. So specifically, it's going to take any instructions from your conscious mind and pass them to your subconscious. And you're always telling your RAS what to look for. You're always by what you're thinking about. You just don't realize you're doing it. So, you know, my partner's always criticizing me. They're always nagging me. They're always judging me. The RAS, that's your conscious thought. Your RAS hears that as the instruction or order look for my partner criticizing me. And of course you see it all the time. Your partner's always criticizing you. You hear it constantly. So uh, the example I always give is if you've ever bought a new car, you see it all over on the road. It's because consciously you're thinking of, you know, a gray Nissan Pathfinder. And then uh, it sends that to the subconscious to look for gray Nissan Pathfinders and you, and you see them everywhere. That's how that looks. So if you're thinking things like, you know, we don't communicate because he never listens, guess what you're going to find? Uh, I'm going to try, but I know what she's going to say. Guess what she's going to say? <laughs> I know it's not going to work. Uh, the only problem at my job is that my boss is, a, is an asshole. Wh whatever it is, you're essentially telling that RAS to look for all those things and it'll find it all the time. And it, it, the scary part is it acts just like the confirmation bias. It will filter out. See, the brain is very efficient. So all these different mechanisms come together to be efficient. 
So it will filter out anything that doesn't match what you're thinking. So when your partner is loving and kind and appreciative and says, thank you and all those good things, you're not going to see it. When your boss is telling you what a great job you're doing, you're going to dismiss it. This is why you get into those, you know, they said, you said arguments. I, I don't remember you doing that. You didn't say that. It's because your RAS is filtering out those nice things and you were left proving yourself right over and over. And when this is working, think about it with that confirmation bias, you can see how it's just a losing battle, how hard this is. Um, and since you might be asking right now, well, this is all great, Abby, but how the heck do I align my, you know, conscious and unconscious mind? So I stopped doing this. Um, I've got you, you know, I've got you, uh, because I love you so much. I've created the, how to align your conscious and unconscious mind toolkit. <laughs> how do you like that? I have some tools in there that very specific to help you do just this, align those two things. And, uh, you're going to find, you know, once you align, start aligning those things, the deep connection, the trust, it really starts to build. It's amazing how quickly it works. And of course it's free because I love you. Uh, and you can come over to the website, abbymedcalf.com forward slash podcast. And you can find that on the show notes page of this is episode uh, 151 and it's right there for you. You can download it there. All right. So let's get to reason number three. We're going to wrap up today. You're blaming someone else. This is the third reason that communication tools in the past haven't worked. If you're blaming anyone else for the reason your communication is failing, you're setting yourself up to fail. Just telling you that right now. If you want to consistently and effectively communicate, you need to take 100% responsibility and focus on your side of the street and not the other person. I say all the time, you co-create every single relationship you have. So focus on your part of that creation. And when I say 100% responsibility, I'm not talking about blame or fault. I'm not telling you to take on the other person's responsibility in the relationship. That would be, you know, 110% or 140%. That's called codependency. I have all kinds of podcasts on codependency, so you can go listen to those. That's not what I'm talking about. The, the, I'm talking about you looking at you and really your boundaries. The, the cornerstone of taking full responsibility is setting and keeping your personal boundaries. Having, having healthy emotional boundaries, you know, what does it mean? It means you, you know what you need to feel safe and confident in your world. That's, that's how I think of it. It means you take full responsibility for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions, and no responsibility for another person's thoughts, feelings, or actions. You cannot control how someone's going to react to the information you give. You can only control you and how you present it and keeping your boundary. So, don't, you know, and don't blame someone else for not respecting your boundary. I see that all the time. It's your job to respect your boundary. It's your job to hold your boundary. So, and having said that, because I love you, please don't beat yourself up. If it's been tough in the past for you to say no or to confront someone who's trampled your boundaries, uh, holding boundaries is a skill. And like any skill you need to practice to get good at it. So you're not going to be perfect at it. You're just not for a while. But if you practice, if you keep doing this, it really will shift just like anything else. If you practice, you'll get better. And I want you to, because when you keep your healthy emotional boundaries, the benefits are, I can't even, they're amazing. They're, they're everywhere. You know, you have higher self-esteem, higher confidence, self-confidence, self-respect. Uh, you're less codependent overall because you're separating your thoughts, feelings, and needs from other people's thoughts, feelings, and needs. You're more loving uh, in your relationships because you can trust and be more vulnerable. You have a stronger sense of yourself, you know, your self-identity. I mean, it's all there. And I have done many a podcast on loving detachment, which also has a lot about boundaries in it, on boundaries, on codependency, saying no, how to say no. It's all there. <laughs> I will link to all of it. It's all there. Uh, come on over abbymedcalf.com forward slash podcast and right there on the page, we'll have all those wonderful things. 
Uh, so that's it. That is it for today. I do end, you know, I do stop talking. So it's just it for now. And thank you for hanging out with me. I, I really do love it when we hang out. <laughs> It's really fun to come back to the podcast. I've missed it. I had a nice break, but I really missed it. And I feel very energized and excited to be back. Remember to listen to the next two episodes because I'm going to cover the five signs that you're not communicating, right? The, how to know that you're not communi communicating. And then my five-step process to effective communication in every relationship. And remember again to come over to get your free made with 100% love how to align your conscious and unconscious mind toolkit. And that's really it. I adore you. Know that you're loved and have a great day. And I'll talk to you soon.